probably the one, uh, a great topic for me because this is one of the most exciting things that I've added to my practice uh, this past year. And I'm excited to share with you all, this, uh, all the great data that's come out of uh, the clinical trials. So I hope you get a kick out of it. A couple of disclosures to note. Uh, I am a consultant and a medical advisor for Arconia, the manufacturer of the device I'll be speaking about. Uh, the device is uh, FDA cleared for laser-assisted liposuction. That's obviously not what we're doing here uh, with the device. Uh, but there is a 510K uh, market approval affiliated with this device. So the process that we're going to talk about is an off-label process with an FDA cleared device. Uh, we'll go through the background and the, and the objectives of the study, uh, the study design and the device itself, the particulars, uh, the success criteria and how they were chosen, and all of the results, all of the data. Um, and then part two, I'll tell you a little bit about my experience at Bauman Medical Group with the device since July. And uh, we'll talk a bit about practical considerations. And those of you who know me uh, know that uh, I'm an uh, audiovisual kind of guy. We have a lot of data to get through, but I promise I've got something really interesting at the end uh, if you make it, the, make it through. So uh, I've spoken a number of different occasions about low-level laser therapy at this conference and others. Uh, and actually, uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Maloney, is actually giving a talk right now about the, uh, the science behind low-level laser therapy. And so if you're here, you're not hearing that. So, uh, But I encourage you to, to learn as much as you can about low-level laser therapy. It's a great technology. It's non-chemical uh, non treatment, obviously, non-thermal, non-burning. Uh, low-level laser is red or near-infrared wavelengths applied usually to the outside of the body. Um, and we've had, we have FDA market approvals for pain control, wound healing, liposuction, as I mentioned, and even a device for hair growth. And although the mechanism is not 100% clear, uh, the powers that be and the, and the, the scientists uh, on this side of the ocean and the other come, have come to think that it has something to do with this, the activation of cytochrome C oxidase pathways and uh, production of ATP and CAMP uh, through these cellular cascades. There are certainly lots of textbooks and lots of websites uh, that I can direct you to if you're interested in the science, and as well as other organizations like the ASLMS. So a little bit on the background. Laser therapy um, and its effect on adipocytes has been studied for over, about 10 years or so. And uh, Rodrigo Nieira, who's uh, a gentleman when he first started with lasers, didn't speak much English, uh, has demonstrated that the, that exposure to low-level laser therapy, with exposure to low-level laser, adipocytes uh, change. And uh, they do emulsify within just several minutes. Now, Dr. Nieira happens to be uh, married to a uh, radiologist, so that makes it very convenient if you're a plastic surgeon and you want to do some uh, investigations on, uh, on what's going on at the level of the fat. You can zap your patient with a laser and then send them off for an MRI and CAT scans and such and CT scans, and certainly he's done that as well as uh, some pretty deep, detailed investigations with electron microscopy. And so the photo that you see here on your left uh, shows intact adipocytes, as well as some adipocytes that have been affected by low-level laser therapy. And the photo on the right shows uh, droplets leaking out of the adipocytes after several minutes of exposure. So there's a number of studies in the, uh, in the clinical literature about this effect. Um, and in fact, this is one of the uh, Th those are some of the studies that led to the FDA clearance of this device for laser-assisted liposuction. Um, anybody interested in liposuction, the, the laser actually helps the fat come out of the body quicker and uh, with less uh, pain in recovery, less bruising, and, uh, and better skin retraction and skin tightening. Well, that's a story for another day. Um, the objective of this, of this uh, study is to uh, determine whether the... Um, exposure of low-level laser therapy uh, to the outside of the body will change body circumference. And so we're looking at the reduction of circumference measurements of the waist, hips, and thighs using the device called Zorona. Placebo-controlled, computer-generated randomization, double-blind, parallel, multi-center trial, uh, IRB approved, 67 patients. And interesting to note that they were prepared to actually do more patients, um, but it would not have changed the statistical outcome of this uh, of this, uh, of this study, uh, the data was that strong. So 35 were in the active or test group, and 32 were in the placebo group. The data was collected prior to treatment, at the end of the first week, at the end of the second week, and two weeks after the treatments were completed. And of course, we measured the hips waist in both thighs. Uh, we also added those together to get a total combined circumference, and we measured the patient's BMI. 
the procedure protocol using the Zorona laser, uh, six treatments with the laser or with a, with a sham device. It was administered over two weeks. Patients were treated uh, three treatments per week on non-consecutive days. So for example, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And each treatment is 40 minutes total. 20 minutes on one side, and we flip you and do 20 minutes on the other. Patients were instructed not to change their diet or activity or, or engage in any additional uh, changes from their normal regimen. The laser device pictured here on the right is the Urconia Zorona. Um, Urconia is based in Texas, by the way. It's a five laser diode scanner. You can see there are four appendages to this laser, and uh, four appendages which each have a spinning laser beam, and the center, which also contains a diode. 635 is the wavelength, and each diode puts out 17 milliwatts of power. The placebo group got treatment with a five, laser, a five LED unit, which put out obviously much less power. Both devices were designed to have the same physical appearance, and uh, including the appearance of light output during the treatment, because obviously the patient's awake and has their eyes open. Appropriate goggles were worn by the subjects during the anterior part of the treatments. So our primary objective and the success criteria is as follows. Uh, change in the total uh, circumference, that's the, the total combined circumference of the hips, waist, and thighs from pre-treatment baseline compared to the end of week two, which would take you through the six treatments. Individual subject, subject success was based on a greater than three inch reduction of that total inch loss from the pre-treatment baseline to the end of that two week. And overall study success was that we wanted to see a greater than 35% difference between the treatment groups, meaning the difference between the uh, placebo and the test group. So here are the results. This is the individual success criteria met by each treatment group. And you can see the number in the placebo subjects, the number of the test subjects. The number of patients in the placebo group that achieved more than three inches loss was two. And the amount of test subjects in the treatment group uh, had more than three inches loss was 22, uh, which is quite a big difference, 6% versus 62%. 62.86%, and this was statistically significant, a p-value of 0 0.0001. 57% more test group participants than the placebo showed a total decrease in combined circumference from the pre-procedure uh, to the study endpoint of the three inches or greater. And this outcome exceeded the pre-established uh, target difference of 35% by quite a bit, more than 30%. The comparison of the two groups between the continuous variable, the mean changes, and the total combined circumference, which is the total number of inches from a study baseline to endpoint, demonstrated a mean difference of negative 2.837. And this was also found to be statistically significant. 